On the last day of the world, I would want to plant a tree. What? For not for the fruit. The tree that bears the fruit is not the one that was planted. I want the tree that stands in the earth for the first time, when the sun already going down, and the water touching its roots, in the earth full of the dead and the clouds passing, one by one, over its leaves. I'm going to appreciate that one day. So what I'm going to do now is um, turn the podium over to Mindy Boyd, and she's going to tell you a bit about how she came to write poetry that you're going to hear today and read some of her poems for you. And um, I think, why don't you, when you're done, just um, Joyce Hill will be our, our next reader. And so when you're done, just uh, call her up to the podium. So we well, welcome Mandy here. And I would like to say that it was a very technical, theatrical type of writing, but it's not. It's just wordplay. It's words that I love to hear. It's for children. Um, I love writing children's poetry. And I never did anything with it. I have these little books just, you know, stuck in the bookcase. And um, eventually I'd like to get it together enough for maybe the grandchildren. When I have grandchildren, they could read it. And I was really nervous about today, but then I thought, it's you. Why should I be nervous? You're not, you're not going to judge me. So um, my writing style is kind of odd. Either I find some words that I like, and I play with them and keep playing with them. And they're just simple rhyming, like, you know, Dr. Seuss type. Or it's really weird. You'll be in the shower shampooing your hair, and all of a sudden it's like, you know, you're all wet and dripping and you're trying to write it down on a piece of paper and you can't read it next. When you go to translate it, it's like all dripped out, you know. And that's how um, the, the first one I'm going to read to you um, came about. I was in the shower. Where it came from, I don't know. I guess I have odd shower thoughts. Um, the first one is Sudsy Soda Pop. And these are all children's. Sudsy Soda Pop lived in an old man's shop. He sat against the wall waiting for the children to come to call. They would drop in a thin silver coin in the slot and out would slide a soda pop. Sudsy had a few to choose from. There was cherry, strawberry, root beer too, but the favorite was good old Mountain Dew. <laughs> it was bubbly cold and hit the spot and everybody loved Sudsy Soda Pop. On a hot summer day, the old man knew the children would come in after they played. Sudsy would clank as their change filled his box, and out would fly the soda pops. There was never a frown, it was only smiles all around. Sudsy was older than those he knew, except for the old man who ran the shop. He remembered what it was like to get a nickel soda pop. The frosty little bottles felt cool against your face. They even helped to slow your pace. So the little old man kept Sudsy around, and it was the most, most popular pace in town. Like I told you, it's very simple. Um, and that is just because we used to go on drive-abouts. My dad would say, it's Saturday, let's go on a drive-about. We'd always end up on some dirt road someplace, and there would be some old shop there. And sure enough, they would have these little Coke machines, and you'd put in a coin, and you'd pull out the bottle. And I guess it was a memory. 25 cents. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, the next one. I will laugh. No, excuse me. I will laugh and dance. I will sing and play. I will be your friend night and day. 
close your eyes and I am there. You can hear me anywhere. I'll make time fly away. I'll make your life happy and gay. I'm your imagination. Cool. I don't share well with others, so they say. <laughs> I like to take all the toys away. It's not so unheard of for me to pick a fight, because most of the time I think I'm right. And sometimes, if I don't get my way, I will simply refuse to play. But I don't feel like it's I'm wrong. Sometimes I just don't want to get along. Mother says I have to learn to play, be nice, share every day. She really doesn't understand the problem isn't with me, it's my brother's ham. <laughs> that was my Shelby. Nothing was ever Shelby's fault. Nothing. Um, growing up, I had um, a, poem, a treasury of poems. It had Mother Goose on it. I don't know if you guys remember it, if any of you have remembered that book with the checkered board and the Mother Goose, and it had all the nursery rhymes in it. And it really hit, I, I just, even when I was older, I would just love to read them uh, because they just touched your imagination. This one is called Algernon the Ant. It's another very short one. Algernon the Ant had a problem with his pants. They kept falling to the ground. Try as he may, they just would not stay around his waist until the day. His mother tied his pants with a honeysuckle branch and said, go play. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I was so prepared. I was going to write everything out, and then I thought, no, I'm just. Okay, so I did use that scene. Um, King Applejack. King Applejack lived in a shack at the end of the railroad tracks. He would carry his apples around in a sack strapped to his back. He worked here and there to show people his wear. Golden crisp apples, he would declare. Sweet and juicy red ones, a nickel a pair. Crabby little green ones, for those who like to glare. Up and down the town, King Applejack would roam, always selling his apples, all alone. Till one day, as we were driving home, we could not believe our eyes, for standing with King Applejack was a lady wearing a cherry hat. We wondered, who could that possibly be? So we rolled down our window to see. Apple Jack, who's the lady with the cherry hat? He smiled and gave her a pat and said, this is my sister, Cherry Blossom, and she lives over in Dawson. <laughs> so they're just, um, I didn't time them either, Dr. Jenkins. Um, they're just children's um, poems that are silly and I like the word rhyme and I think most of all poetry comes from your heart. It's just something that you, sometimes when you write a story you want to give, you're writing it to give to others. And with poetry, the first time you write it, you're writing it to give to yourself. And then you decide whether you're going to share it. And I appreciate you listening. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from Dr. Joyce Hill, and she's going to have some selections for us. So, welcome, Dr. Hill. Well, he is yours. Or I'm, you strip I'm, I'm terrified here, <laughs> and I speak in front of people all the time, and I'm terrified because this is um, my poetry. I have been writing poetry since I was in high school. And um, the reason I write poetry is because I like words. I love words. Um, I like how words look on the page. I like different, I did a lot of art in high school and we did a lot of calligraphy. And that's where I found that words look neat on the page. So the first poems I ever wrote were all about how the word looked on the page where it was spaced, how big it was, and so forth. And then after I did that, I thought, well, that doesn't, they look cool. 
but there's nothing there. So then, in, later in high school and college, I started having these, I started, I get these little bitty snippets of emotion. Have you ever had that? Mm -hmm. Just a little bitty for two minutes, this intense emotion, like you see somebody or you see something or something happens, and you get this, <clears throat> this real intense little snippet of emotion. And I thought, well, maybe that's what poems are about. So I started writing about those little snippets of emotion. <clears throat> like if you're at a funeral, you ever get a little snippet? A funeral is a sad thing, but um, there's also um, another little snippet of emotion you might get at a funeral, like, this is me, this will be me. Did you ever think you get that? So I started writing poems about that, and that's what this one is about. This is a little just a little snippet of emotion that I got at a funeral for a very good friend, and it's called Winter's Chill. A deep winter's chill invaded the mountain, snuck across the valley, set up a base camp, shrouded the land in damp black fog. Spring came with shoots of new green grass. The chill remained, withered the grass, Descro destroyed the insurgent beginnings of hope. Summer arrived with a promise of sunlight. The chill persisted, blocked the sun, erased the warming of light and well-being. Fall crept in with a hint of a blaze of colors. Still, the chill hung, drowned the colors, made permanent the black shroud of clouds. A deep winter's chill conquered the mountain occupied the valley, became a forest and a fortress, evolved to a condition of the way of life. Mm. That was, that was you know, I don't like you know, too much. Um, and when I was in college studying for my PhD, I was surrounded by these powerful women. Okay, a lot of very powerful, strong, forward-thinking women. And a lot of them were struggling to make a place in life, to obtain a PhD, to uh, become a leader, to become the head of, of something. So for about a year there, I, did, I wrote a lot of poems about women and how women um, go through and how women are perceived and those again those little snippets of in, of emotion that I would see around certain women and this one is about women and dignity leaping forward she catches the hint of her own magnificence mm -hmm. she is powerful but largely unrecognized struggling upward she hears the whisper of her own generosity. She is graceful, but mostly demeaned. Standing upright, she tastes the flavor of her own strength. She is enduring, but always shortchanged. So that was from that. Then this one was just for fun. This is called Like Women. No one can circle the women wagons like women. <laughs> no one can light the tunnels like women. No one can see the tears like women. No one can comprehend the sorrows like women. No one like women. So you can see those women had a of that time had a very powerful influence on me. And this last one I'm going to read is, this is not a children's poem. None of these are children's poems. Huh? But this last one um, I wrote this year, um, it was just, I was in the office and it was, a, it was late on a Friday afternoon and I was the only one there and it was in the winter and it was getting kind of dark and I had this little thing of emotion. This is called On Memory. Through these very halls, memory creeps, 
in the doors, over the chairs, up the bookcases, down the walls, to the floor where it sits, waits, snarls with dripping fangs, bony claws, hollow eyes, and spiked tail. I hear it now, sliding past the corner, scratching up across against the baseboard, snarling in its throat. How could I know that such a vague thing would terrify me so? Memory. That's it. That's it. And that was for fun? Huh? That was for fun. That was for fun. <laughs> what do you mean for fun? You said this one's for fun. Well. <laughs> and then we're like all terrified. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's kind of sometimes fun to put those little pieces yes. of motion down on a piece of paper because then you can deal with them. Yes. And they don't. So that's for fun? <laughs> that's what we meant. I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have some funny ones, but we're not. Well, thank you, Joyce. Thank you, Mandy, for being the courageous first two. We're great. <laughs> and we are going to um, continue tomorrow, same bat time, same bat channel. But I wanted to let you know about some resources we have at the library, since we are in the library. We have 63 of the Landon series of videos. These are poets reading yeah. their own works, mm -hmm. being interviewed, and I'll start the video is running when we're done here, and they will play out in our lobby. So I just pulled these four. So if you're out in the stacks, they're um, uh, these blue and white. They're on VHS now. We'll see if we can't get them transfer to DVD. But um, yeah, so they'll look like this, and they're all. I think they're no, they're not together. Sometimes we have them together. Sometimes we have them just filed alphabetically. It just depends on what the director feels like doing at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Every me and you. Yes, me and me. That's why she's the director. Oh, yeah. We, we all put our stamp on the collection, so some years there will be South American uh, folk tales in abundance, depending on who's in charge. But if you're interested in hearing it, I, I am coming to believe more and more you have to hear the poet read their works to really appreciate it. So I got a whole lot more out of the poems I heard today than I have in a very long time of, of years of reading other poetry. So thank you. Thank you both very much Not for helping me. But thanks everybody for coming. And thank you, Mandy, for having something great. You shouldn't say well, thank that. You. you shouldn't ever say they're just children's poems. They're really quite clever. Yeah. Well, thank that you. Takes a lot of a lot of thought. A lot of Thank you. <coughs> and, chil and children deserve complicated, clever things. Clever things, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Now, you guys can have your cookies or coffee. Or